In the 20th century, two great wars plagued a generation, and cultures from across the world processed their subsequent trauma through their art. German expressionist filmmakers sought an escape from the morbid realities of their country post-World War I, so their movies inherently rejected realism, yet expressed their very real struggle with the human condition. The French processed their growing paranoia and fear in the build-up to World War II through poetic realism. These films aimed to show the world as it really was, but also go beyond it, to find beauty in it. They were trapped at a difficult place in time, powerless to change their circumstances, so the only thing they could do was try to find meaning and value during that time. The romanticism native to French cinema had been replaced with something a lot darker and existential. Italian cinema had been overseen by a fascist regime for the majority of the early 21st century, where films had to be sanctioned by the General Directorate of Cinematography to promote their pro-fascist ideals through the film industry. After Mussolini was overthrown in World War II, Italian filmmakers took took the opportunity to transcend the artificiality of their industry and focus on the everyday struggles of the working class in a bleak, broken country. They depicted the harsh realities of their nation but also initiated a healing process through the expression of it. This was known as Italian neorealism. You might notice a common thread through these movements, the exploration of the human condition and the blurred lines between the real and absurd. After so much death and destruction, people sought to find meaning in a hopeless world. They had a dire need to process the reality in which they suffered. America's need for this manifested in the form of film noir. Much like Italy, the American film industry had a complicated history with censorship prior to the movement. In 1930, the Motion Picture Distribution of America founded the Hayes Motion Picture Production Code, discouraging all themes related to violence, sex, and illegal activity. The Compensating Moral Values Clause dictated that any character within a film who openly defied the law must receive justice and punishment by the film's end. No crime could go unpunished. This caused a ripple effect across the industry. Hitchcock's 1941 film Suspicion had to shoot multiple endings as the production couldn't be sure that the film would be allowed to release under its original one. George Marshall's The Blue Dahlia had to alter its protagonist, Johnny Morrison, whose background as a murderer was changed to a former policeman. Popular hard-boiled fiction writers such as James Cain and Raymond Chandler had their work censored or banned completely. However, World War II brought an ease to cinematic restrictions due to a need for the output of Allied propaganda. Pro-American war films required more explicit violence in order to depict images of wartime. It was during this moment that filmmakers saw the opportunity and the movement began. Many staples of the genre were produced during wartime, but once the war was over, Hollywood was finally freed from the mandate to produce propaganda and promote patriotism. Filmmakers were sick of the glamorization of their culture, which actively denied the crippled nature of their society. Like the Italians, they needed to process their loss and express their pain as a means of healing. Film noir had a good running start, but after the war, the genre truly flourished. Double Indemnity highlights the drastic change in restrictions of the industry the best. This film is the poster child of the movement. Where writers like Raymond Chandler had previously had their works banned, their books were now being adapted into a movie. The director, Billy Wilder, hailed from Austria, bringing a flavour of German expressionism to combine with Chandler's hard-boiled detective writing. Double Indemnity is, by all accounts, the definitive film noir. It was a statement to the industry that these previously taboo themes were not only allowed, but encouraged. Many tropes ascribed to film noir today are featured in this film. It centres around a morally grey protagonist, often described as a man on the edge. Private investigators are fertile ground from which these characters grow. Their job requires them to manoeuvre between both sides of the law, and they often become seduced by a femme fatale, defined as a woman who is very attractive in a mysterious way, usually leading men into dangerous and compromising situations, causing their destruction. Prior to the movement, women largely served as a muse or a romantic interest in movies, but America had experienced a change in the balance of power between genders post-war. Many physically and psychologically wounded male veterans returned home to find women had developed financial and sexual independence after joining the workforce, and men found such women alluring but also frightening. Phyllis Diedrichson was a prime example of this archetype in Double Indemnity, where women now derived power from their sexuality rather than weakness. Corruption and moral ambiguity lies at the heart of all great noirs. Authoritative roles are often depicted much differently from tradition, with most lawmen being corrupt or rotten. The line between hero and villain becomes very blurred. Many films find their characters to be simple cogs in the machine, where the system will always win. Like many countries during the war, the populace was subjected to the powers that be, who used them flippantly for their own gains. There's a sense of helplessness that persists throughout most noir stories that no hero can ever hope to beat. In the end, the protagonist is both a criminal and a victim of a larger power. The other key component is the composition. Shadows, intricate patterns, skewered angles and dark tones dominate the genre. The mise-en-scene usually adds a feeling of inevitability and doom to the characters, placing them in large portraits where they're often dwarfed by darkness and rarely placed in positions of control within the frame. 
Linearity is the enemy of film noir. Stories are often told in non-chronological order with a narration from a character looking back in retrospect. Conspiracy is designed to confuse you and steer you down the wrong path away from those who rather remain unseen, and the narrative of these films reflects that. One could often finish a film noir and wonder what the point of it was. In the end, it was all for nothing and no one achieved what they wanted. Many veterans returning home from war asked the same questions, and while it seemed that the films provide no solution to this problem, the very expression of it is an answer. It's telling the audience, we know how you feel and you're not alone. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. To this day, you will hear people critiquing newly released movies and classing them as a noir story. But the movement only lasted from 1941 to 1958. The films of this period are technically the only ones to be classed definitively as such, which means even classics of the genre such as Chinatown are not technically within the canon. Everything post-1958 is a spiritual successor, and the passing of the torch continues the movement's feeling through time as the internal conflicts and socio-economic issues of the West continue to change. This successor would go on to be known as neo-noir. A movement reacting to a global war and all the tragedies that occurred within it is not something that can be sustained as time goes on. The world grows more peaceful and complacent, or the big issues facing society change entirely. The nature of warfare changes. Nowadays, America isn't always the good guy, and often wars are fought outside of the battlefield. So it's hard to understand how the genre survived since its conception. Like anything that wishes to survive, it had to adapt. But the fact that it's been able to maintain its core values over the past 80 years says more about our real world than the one on film. Chinatown's plot was rooted in the Watergate scandal that had occurred two years prior to its release. The Manchurian candidate followed soldiers returning from the Korean War who had been brainwashed by communists, highlighting the ludicrousy of far-right McCarthyism and the Red Scare, but also the dangerous mentality of the far left. The remake of the film in the early 2000s changed the focus to the Gulf War, with a social commentary on how multinational corporations profited from it during the Bush-Cheney administration. The genre has taken on a responsibility to comment on the wider issues of the time, but as time goes on, the issues plaguing nations and the wider world become more nuanced and intricate. Adapting to contemporary socio-economic and political issues is one way which the genre has survived but it's also done it through branching off into various sub-genres. In the blockbuster sense, film noir found its way into sci-fi and superhero films and has complemented each genre surprisingly well, but there have been other, more niche sub-genres that have accumulated smaller filmographies over time. But I'll tell you what, after seeing Los Angeles, and this is here story I'm about to unfold, well, uh, I guess I've seen something every bit as stupefying as you'd see in any of those other places. For lack of a better term, stoner noirs have found their own space in today's industry. Films like Under the Silver Lake, Inherent Vice, The Kid Detective, Confess Fletch, The Nice Guys, and The Big Lebowski all find their story strongly rooted in the principles of the movement. While not all of these films contain a focus on stoners or drugs in general, they take place in incredibly relaxed settings with more aloof protagonists, often more in line with the beach bump archetype than the man on the edge. They're not necessarily outcasts in the traditional sense, but certainly occupy a space between the normal population and people on the fringe of society. The stoner element complements these films very well. Often the plot involves an idea of falling down a rabbit hole of increasingly complex conspiracy, with many distractions littered around the world to steer these characters off course. The external tone of the film seems much lighter, but underneath this superficial layer lies incredibly dark characters and a prevailing sense of hopelessness and pain. Asian cinema has carved out an impressive slate of noir filmography from Japan to Korea, and although a little late to the game, film noirs featuring female leads are becoming more prevalent in the modern age. However, there is a developing trend of overusing the term film noir, and many filmmakers and audiences ascribe the term to films that don't necessarily fall under the bracket. If you look up the John Wick series, you'll likely see the genre comes under neo-noir. It's a film with a lot of dark imagery and a morally grey protagonist, but outside of that, it has nothing to do with the genre. This bastardization of the term helps keep the genre alive on paper, but in reality, it risks diluting the traits of the original movement to the point where these movies become something unrecognizable. Any film that's dark and includes some form of corruption is now being dubbed as neo-noir. And my theory is, it makes the film sound more smart. An action movie carries a certain stigma, but a neo-noir thriller has a certain ring to it. There are many recent films that do in fact fall under the category. As society's issues becomes more nuanced, so too do the films. I'm not the first person to say that we're in a time where alienation and distrust of authority are at an all-time high. In the age of the internet, 
internet, information is aplenty and the truth is skewered and it becomes hard to decipher what's real and what's fake through all the noise. And technology is only serving to make the artificial increasingly indistinguishable from the real. It's connecting us, yet separating us at the same time. Our morally grey protagonist has developed to reflect the next generation of viewers as they try to navigate through a world of digital strife and misinformation. The influx of attention to mental health and male loneliness has tapped into an audience and sparked a controversial dialogue. Nightcrawler examines the heartless nature of news reporting and people's obsession with tragedy. It exposes how mainstream media exploits our instinct to be drawn towards the horrid and the negative, and induce a mentality of fear-mongering in order to increase viewership. Its main character reflects the by any means necessary approach to success, and just how addictive we've become to productivity and rising through the corporate ladder in the modern day. Lou has a personality disorder, and while the film does a great job of getting us to empathise with him, it's clear by the end of the story that the only real way to prosper and cope with a career in news media is by being a literal psychopath. What if my problem wasn't that I don't understand people, but that I don't like them? The new Blade Runner film examines the growing obsession with e-girls or artificial relationships with digital women. Technology has made an entire generation of adults antisocial, from increased exposure to information via the internet and social media, along with social movements, women are now more wary of men who approach them, and men are more anxious about being rejected. Historically, men are expected to make the first move, but due to the reasons already mentioned, they're much more reluctant to do so. Corporations have fueled this gap via the internet, and then capitalized on it by developing products to satiate male desire and loneliness. But but in the end, everyone's suffering due to the same thing. Both sides miss out in this scenario. The relationship between Kay and Joy is inherently unhealthy. He lives an obvious lie with a superficial wife, which seems tragic in a way. But the film makes a convincing case for how their love for each other is real, only to tear that notion down and cripple him, showing how these artificial women are just a product designed to exploit your loneliness. Multiple real women make advances on him during the film, but he rejects them all, and he can't bear life without his AI companion. Even her name, Joy, is a not-so-subtle reference to a prominent type of pornography. The director of the most recent Batman movie, Matt Reeves, has spoken at length about the emotional immaturity of his Bruce Wayne. This character has been beloved by male audiences for decades and has seen many variations. Previous generations experienced a charming, well-kept man with a handle on his life and a hesitance to express his internal struggle, but he has become increasingly angry and conflicted as the years have gone on. Robert Pattinson's iteration is emblematic of a lot of problems young males are facing today. He's invested his entire life in developing a certain set of unique skills, but it comes at the cost of developing basic emotional maturity and an inability to communicate with those who matter to him the most. His entire being is formed around a drive to avoid processing his childhood trauma, finding an outlet through extremely unhealthy means. With each of these examples, it might feel like we're getting further and further away from the topic at hand, but if you break each one down to the basic ingredients, you'll see a strong resemblance to the original movement, hopelessness and alienation in a society that's too big for any one person to overcome, a society that's changing too fast to keep up with. It would be incredibly reductive to compare the men's suffering today to the trauma of the veterans returning from the war, but whatever films like Double Indemnity and the Maltese Falcon were tapping into back in the 40s, films like Blade Runner and Nightcrawler are tapping into now. The fascinating and worrying world of incel culture has become strongly tied to many modern day neo-noirs. The films I've already mentioned, along with Drive, Fight Club, Taxi Driver and many more, have developed a narrative with a certain type of viewer. This idea of a very lonely, unhealthy young male, a social outcast who lives by night and struggles to communicate with women, who feels oppressed and forbidden to express himself at the risk of rejection or punishment. We have to watch these characters has gradually realized that they are not special, and the world will go on without them regardless of whether they're still drifting through it. You are not special. You are not a beautiful or unique snowflake. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything else. Much like the plot of Fight Club, we're seeing the characters of these films tap into some deep-rooted pain within a large group of the population, which provokes a strong reaction, one that causes men to idolize and deify certain people that they perhaps shouldn't, and it causes them to lose sight of the very reason they love this film to begin with and turn into something worse. It's painfully ironic that this kind of thing is happening in 2023, because back in the early 2000s, Fight Club addressed this issue, showing how lost young males can easily fall into traps through idolizing the wrong principles. The film was a warning, and yet so many of us have taken the wrong meaning from it and other films like it, much like the characters in the movie. What I've just described is essentially the character arc of the Riddler, once again showing how this genre reflects the ever-developing problems in our society. Film noir is manifesting in reality now stronger than ever. Some of these movies like Under the Silver Lake or The Kid Detective feel like an antidote to this issue. They tick the box of every trope on the checklist, but our character manages to find a way to endure. The ending is not necessarily hopeful, but the very fact they find a way to survive in this world is a victory within itself. They may not solve their conflict by the end of the story, but they have begun the healing process and are more able to carry 
carry their burden. I believe therein lies the crux of the genre. Sometimes there are no answers, there is no justice, and you will fall down the wrong path in life. The only thing you can hope to do in those situations is endure, suffer, and allow the pain to run its course, and know that while you're alone in the process, there are many in the world who share your burden. None of these films are bad or unhealthy, and what we take away from them is equally important in each one. The messages are up to the individual to interpret, but how we act on those interpretations is up to us. Right now there is a growing trend in social media, where men approach drunk girls outside of nightclubs and interrogate them for the movies that are red flags in a man. I think this trend is equally disrespectful to both men and women, but it's a symptom of the contemporary problems that these neo-noirs are dealing with. These videos are designed to take advantage of inebriated women who are more likely to be unrestrained in their opinion than they would have been earlier in the day, and the aim of these videos is to use those opinions to fuel male rage, making men feel insecure for liking certain movies, and consequently doubling down on those opinions and resenting women for rejecting them. Neo-noirs are now involved in an issue that could have never existed back in the conception of the movement. People could only be familiar with the movie if they had seen it, whereas now, everyone has a vague recognition of these films through the memes on their social media feed, often edited in a way to make the movie seem as though they hate women or left-wing notions in general. Like Nightcrawler, the media exploits bias and fears to provoke conflict and garner attention for profit. We're in a fascinating yet very scary time. Film noir was a reaction to society, but now society is reacting to film noir. Ultimately, I believe this attempt will fail. What these social media pariahs misunderstand is that eventually, a new film will show this issue from a more objective, carefully crafted perspective, thereby taking the power out of those in our culture who alienate us and further sow division. There will always be another problem and there will always be another film to respond to it. It will outlive any single person. We all enjoy certain movies because they tap into something that resonates with our subconscious and expresses an internal issue within ourselves through an external medium. It's therapeutic. The issues stem from how we choose to react to those expressions, whether you allow it to confirm a bias or use it to help view your problems from an outside perspective. The power of film noir lies in its birth. It was born out of a need to express alienation, grief, paranoia, hopelessness, and anger. These are all feelings we experience in our life times, and it highlights how helpless we feel in relation to the bigger system that we're born into. And as time goes on, we only uncover more about the ugliness of that system as information becomes more accessible. This is how film noir survived through the years, and why it will likely never die. Or perhaps a more fitting statement would be that as long as we have major systemic issues in our society, we will always have film noir. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. <laughs>